Uh, but we will begin this morning in John 18. So today is what is characteristically known in Christian culture as Palm Sunday uh, memorializes the final ascent of our Savior into Jerusalem before his death on the cross. And it is a good time for us to contemplate the death of our Savior uh, on this Sunday morning. For it is the death of our Savior that secured for us redemption. And even as we've been considering in our time together in Galatians over the past couple of weeks, newness of life. And the theme of Christ's death is one uh, that will not... Uh, elude us in the coming months at Legacy Baptist Church as we consider for a few more weeks uh, following this, this time around resurrection, we'll consider uh, the, the book of Galatians, uh, the power of the cross as represented there in Galatians, only then to return after that to Genesis 22 and consider Abraham's sacrifice of his son Isaac and the spiritual picture which that reflects. But since we are in Galatians right now, as in that mini-series, uh, which calls us to walk in newness of life, which exhorts us to stand fast in the liberty uh, wherewith Christ hath made us free, that grace gospel secured by Christ's death, by living in our own death to self and in Christ's life for us, we're going to direct our attention, as I said, toward the end of our time in Hebrews 12, thinking through uh, the idea of endurance rooted in what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. But first, what I'd like to do is I'd like to walk through the events of the crucifixion together. It's good to bubble these things up. Around Christmas every year, we bubble up various aspects of the events of our, uh, of our Savior's first coming, of the, the, the excitement and the confusion and the uh, interest surrounding His birth, all that we may look forward to His, his sure second coming. And it's good for us every year around this time of resurrection to think through in a formal manner our Savior's death, His burial, and then His resurrection. So you're there if, if you turn to John 18. And in verses 1 through 3, the Bible says this. When Jesus had spoken these words, He went forth with His disciples over the brook Kedron, where was the garden, into which He entered and His disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oftentimes re resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. So we pick up the narrative with Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. They had gone over the brook, uh, the Kidron Valley, the brook Kidron, and they had gone into that, that area east of Jerusalem. They are in the garden of Gethsemane. When a band of men and officers sent from the chief priests and Pharisees arrived to arrest Jesus, having been betrayed into their hands by one of Jesus' disciples, Judas Iscariot. Jesus asks whom they are seeking, and when they answer that they are seeking Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus said to them, I am he, after which they fell backward upon the ground. Having then established Christ's identity, the Bible tells us that Peter drew his sword and swung at the head of the high priest's servant, a man named Malchus, cutting off his ear. Jesus stayed Peter's hand, telling him that that, that is not the spirit of what they are doing at this time. He heals the man, returning its ear, his ear to its rightful place. The men then took Jesus, and the disciples all fled, save for Peter and John. Thus we skip to verse 13 of John 18, where we read this. And led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. So Jesus is first brought before uh, the father-in-law to Caiaphas, a man named Annas. They were uh, sort of co-regents as high priests at the time. And Peter stood outside the door, the Bible says, listening from afar, in intended anonymity, refusing any true association with Jesus. Now, this did not work, the Bible tells us. Peter ends up denying that he has any association as the people seek to recognize him. Isn't that the man that followed Jesus? And Peter says no. He ends up denying the Lord three times, just as Jesus said he would. And when he realizes what he had done, when he realizes that he had denied association with the Lord after having said not long ago that he would never do such a thing, the Bible says Peter went out and he wept bitterly. 
Now, before the high priest, Jesus was questioned about his person and his doctrine. We see Jesus' response to that in John 18, beginning in verse 20. The Bible says, And Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. So Jesus speaks to his message, and he says, there's nothing I've said that's been in secret. He's not some sort of secret conspirator of any way, shape, or form. Everything he said, he said in the open. He said, you don't have to ask me what I've said, as if somehow it was said in the dark corners where only I would know what I've said. You can ask anybody. You can go into the synagogues and ask the synagogues what I say, because I've said it in the synagogues. I've said it publicly. There's nothing here that is a secret. Jesus was led from the hall of Annas into the hall thus of judgment, which was a Roman court. The Jews would not follow him into that court because it was the Sabbath day, and to do so would have defiled themselves before the law on the Sabbath in the time of feast, and thus they would not have been able to participate in the various elements of the day. So they did not follow Jesus into said court, and Jesus was taken to stand before Pilate. Pilate asks the priests for the accusation against Jesus, to which they said, if he weren't a bad guy, do you think we'd have brought him to you? Not, not a particularly clear accusation, just, hey, he's here, we've brought him here, we accuse him, that should be enough for you. Now, this is not a convincing answer, and Pilate is not particularly interested in these matters. He tells them, go judge Jesus according to your law then. Go take him and do your thing. If you're not going to actually accuse him before me, if you're going to play games with me, I don't want to have to mess with it. You go take him and you go do what you want with him. To which the people said, nope, this is unacceptable. We can't let you do that. We can't judge him by our law because you won't let us execute a man and we want this man executed. They had no authority to do that under Roman law. So Pilate then is forced to interrogate Jesus. The leaders in Israel want this man dead. They cannot do it themselves, so they bring him to Pilate. Pilate has to be the one to do it. Pilate can't even hear an accusation, so now he's got to interrogate Jesus to see if he can figure out what's wrong and why it is he's there, of which we read in verses 33 through 40. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews. Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover? Will ye therefore that I should release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So Pilate is relatively disinterested in this whole affair. He asks about Jesus' political ambitions. They say that you're a king. Are you a king? to which Jesus makes it clear that his ambitions are not rooted in some sort of vulgar coup or political overthrow, that he is there as an emissary of and a representative of truth. And Pilate gives that famous line, that line which pervades the consciences and consciousness of so much of our society today, the question uh, which, which roots itself in the hearts of so many, what is truth? Can I know truth? Is there even such thing as truth? Pilate is just as dissatisfied with this conversation as he is with anything else that he's seen in that day. And so he returns to the crowd 
where he states plainly he found no fault in Jesus. Of course, the crowds are outside. They will not come into the court because they will not defile themselves uh, by being in a Gentile court on the Sabbath day. And he says that he finds no fault in Jesus. And he asked them whether that, that he would have them released. He's been arrested. He's been arrested lawfully. Uh, not lawfully in the sense of, uh, of under proper charges, but lawfully in the sense that the, the, the system has been gone through. He is now under arrest. He says, would you all, in that I find no fault in him, like us, like me to release this man? That was a custom uh, on the Passover that they would release one man uh, of the Jews who had been arrested. And the crowd refused this part, and the Bible says... And they demanded rather that Pilate release a man named Barabbas. The Bible calls him in John 18, verse 40, a robber. Matthew calls him a notable prisoner. And Mark 15, verse 7 tells us that not only was he a robber, but that he, uh, during an insurrection, had then committed a murder. But they desire that Barabbas be released, this notable prisoner, And so Pilate yields to the will of the people in this. And the Bible tells us, John 19 tells us, that he took Jesus and he scourged him. And the soldiers mocked him, placed a crown of thorns upon his head. Those same thorns that God had promised to Adam would grow from the ground as a result of man's sin and of man's rebellion, now piercing the head of the sinless man. And after having scourged him and mocked him, John 19 tells us, Pilate again presents him unto the people. They did not want him released. They wanted Barabbas released instead. So Pilate takes him and he beats him and he scourges him and he mocks him. And he presents him to the people desirous that the beating and the scorn would satisfy their anger. Look, now I've beaten him. Now I've scorned him. He, he's learned his lesson. He knows not to speak these things anymore. That should be enough, but it was not enough. And this is where things get very interesting between Pilate and Jesus. We pick up in verse 5 of John 19. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priest therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. So he, again, has been somewhat distant from this whole circumstance. The Jews are angry at him. Their accusations are ambiguous at best. He questions. He finds nothing wrong. He says, should, should I just release this guy? The crowd says, no, release Barabbas. So now he's got to do something with this guy, Jesus. And so he scourges him and he beats him. And he shows them and he's got the crown of thorns and he's got the purple robe and he's been mocked and, as, as a king. And uh, Pilate says that should be enough. And they say, no, we have a law. By the law, he should die. And then they say, because he made himself the son of God. And this troubles Pilate. This is the first part, point where we really see Pilate get engaged in what's happening here. And the Bible says in verse 9, And he went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Where are you come from? Who are you? No answer. Verse 10, Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have the power to crucify thee and have the power to release thee? Pilate is now actually engaged, right? Uh, there, there is an interest here. He is a more forceful. Why won't you answer me? Don't you know that I can have you killed? Don't you know that I have the power to release you? Why aren't you answering my question? Verse 11, Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. At this point, Pilate is invested in Jesus not dying, in Jesus being released. 
We could speculate all of the things that were going on in Pilate's mind and Pilate's heart as he's thinking through what he's witnessing on that day. But it's very evident at this point that he is engaged because he knows that there's something here that's happening that is not only amiss, but that, that this man is something different, something special. But the Jews cried out saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in the place that is called the pavement. But in the Hebrews, in, in the Hebrew, excuse me, Gabbatha. So we, we see here that Pilate wants them to be released and now the people use that public pressure and say, if you release this man, he is a seditionist. He is trying to make himself king. You must not be a friend of Caesar. Adding that political pressure because of course the politics of the day, relationships were everything. You don't want that hint of sedition being allowed to be the specter over your leadership under Caesar. Verse 14. And it was the preparation of the Passover, about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. So Pilate presents Jesus to the crowd. The crowd is not satisfied. They want him crucified. Pilate tells them, You go crucify him. But he would not because he found no fault in him. Pilate is deeply troubled. But the Jews would not let him release Jesus. And Pilate, being a political creature by his nature, being driven by these political ideas, this political onus, delivers Jesus to be crucified. We continue reading verse 17. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him on either side and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Pilate in a very interesting spot on this day. You can see what's the, the, the angst in his spirit over this whole circumstance. Verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam woven from the top through. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but let us cast lots for it. You can cut, rip things easily along the seams, but they weren't going to... Uh, tear the fabric and so they did not tear that one but rather cast lots for it whose it shall be that the scriptures might be fulfilled with saith they parted my raiment among them and for my vesture they did cast lots these things therefore the soldiers did now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, we generally recognize that to be John himself, the author of this gospel. He saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it in his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So Jesus is crucified. Two others with him, one on either side, Jesus in the midst. The soldiers cast lots for his garments. Jesus' loved one watched as he died. Matthew 27 tells us that from the sixth hour to the ninth hour there was darkness upon the whole of the land. 
And in that ninth hour, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Accomplishing his great purpose by bearing the sin of mankind. The Father taking your sin and my sin and making Jesus sin for us. Who knew no sin. And when all of this was accomplished, Jesus uttered those final words. It is finished. And he bowed his head. And the Bible says he gave up the ghost. And it was finished, Christian, on that day. And it is finished, Christian, on this day. That's what we've been learning about in Galatians, isn't it? It is finished. Jesus finished it on that day. Jesus bore your sin on that day. Jesus took it all upon himself on that day. And on that day, it was finished. When Jesus says it is finished, he means it. It is finished. And so we have the very somber account of our Savior's death for the sin of the world. After which he was removed from that cross and he was placed in a tomb. And that's where we leave Jesus for this week. Till we come together next week rejoicing in the resurrection of our Savior and remembering him together. But it is here, in that place of Jesus having cried, it is finished, that I want us to rest for a couple of our, our last minutes today. And it is here where I'd like us to carry our thinking into Hebrews 12, as I told you we would. Hebrews 12 comes, and this might surprise you, but Hebrews 12 comes after Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is that great chapter in our Bibles on faith, right? Hebrews 11 is that chapter where we can read of the faith of men and of women of years gone by, the legacy of faith that we carry into the next generation of those men and those women who sought for that city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God, those who had the chance, had the, the ability to invest themselves in this world that they could see and that they could feel and that they could hear. These were not poor people. Not all of them, at least, were poor. Not all of them were without power. And yet, for all of the, the wealth that they may have had or the power that they may have had or the honor that they may have had, they set aside those things as a priority and they instead died in faith, having not received the promise, but having seen it afar off and embraced them and were persuaded of those things, of those better things, that the things that God had promised, he was able also to perform. And they did all of that, and they carried it in their generation to lay it at our feet. And then we get to pick up that burden, get to pick up that legacy, get to pick up that, 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 that obedience and carry it forward in our own lives. And it is on the heels of all of those testimonies of faith that we read this in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which just so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The exhortation here in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, is that we, having seen those that have gone before us, would set aside the weights and the sins which easily beset us. There are two categories there. Sins, yes, we know of the sins that beset us in our relationship with God. We know of the sins that hinder us in our desire to walk according to faith. But, you know, not everything that gets in our way is sin, is it? We live in a very wealthy nation. There's an awful lot of weights that can grab a hold of us in this nation of wealth. Other priorities, things which are not inherently sinful but which will simply weigh us down as it relates to our capacity 
our vision to simply follow Christ in the way that he's called us to go. The day you accepted Jesus Christ, Christian, you began a race with ups and downs, with hills and valleys, roots and ruts along the path. And the call that we are called unto is not a call unto sinlessness. We will be sinless one day. There's a day where we will uh, die. There's a day where we will leave this mortal body, which we'll talk about next week. There's a day that we will leave this mortality and we will be clothed in immortality. That's the resurrection. That's what we'll talk about next week. Today, we don't rest in the resurrection. I mean, we do. We'll talk about that next week. Today, as in right now, what we're talking about today, today, we're resting in that statement that Jesus made on the cross. It is finished. That's a call unto patience. A call unto faithfulness. It is a call unto patience and faithfulness like those who have gone before us rooted in something. And did you notice what it was rooted in there in verse 2? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus authored our faith. Jesus came and he preached that kingdom of God. Jesus showed us through his life as the way, the truth, and the life, the way that we should walk. And we would look at that like we have considered in the law in Galatians over the last couple of weeks. And we would say, but I can't do that. I cannot walk as Jesus walked. I cannot do what Jesus did. Jesus was the perfect man. Jesus was the perfect righteousness. Hence the reason why Jesus did the thing for us to finish our faith. Namely, he died on the cross for our sins. It is finished, Christ cried on that cross. And Jesus was not kidding when he said it. He was not being hyperbolic. He was not being dramatic. He was not saying it for the benefit of, of the history books. He was saying it because it is true. The work is finished. On that day, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, for the joy of the resurrection that was surely to come, for the joy of the kingdom which is, is coming one day, for the joy of the name that would be given to him which is above all names, for the joy of sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God, he endured the cross and he despised the shame. Today, Christian, you live in it is finished. We are longing for the resurrection. We are, it, it, our, our ticket is, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, your ticket is punched. It's coming one day. The resurrection is yours. You have received the adoption. Again, we'll talk all about that next week. But this week, you are still living and it is finished. Right now, at this time in your life, you're still living and it is finished. When Jesus said it is finished, it was finished through a path. The glory that would come had to pass through the cross. The honor that would come to Jesus had to pass through the shame. The joy that would come had to pass through the sorrow. And Christian, you and I are direct beneficiaries of that day of Jesus' sorrow and of his shame. On that day, Jesus both authored and finished our faith. He secured all things in himself for us to live, not just to live again, but to live today in godliness and enter then into eternity saved from our sins and glorified and declared righteous. And it is for this reason, Christian, that we not only can run this race, much less run it with patience, For our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the power, is the source, is the essence of our Christian life because he is the author and finisher of our faith. So we read Hebrews 11 and we read of these men and we read of their faith and these women and of their faith and of the things that they were able to do in Christ's name. 
And we think through what we've talked about in Galatians over the last couple of weeks. The Christian life does not consist in ordinance or in tradition at its root. That we are not uh, redeemed through corruptible things such as silver and gold. Not through the vain actions received by tradition from our fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. As a lamb without blemish and without spot. And when you see that and you know that, Christian, Christ's sacrificial love for you, when you see him walk through the pain and the sorrow and the shame in order that he may cry out in that day, it is finished. When you understand what happened on that day, when you understand that Jesus bore your guilt on that cross, on the day that, and then you understand what happened on the day that you received that gift by grace through faith unto yourself, it is then... It is in that place that you stand ready for the exhortation to run the race with patience. To follow in the footsteps of those who have gone before you. Lay aside the sin. Lay aside the weight. Those things which would otherwise so easily beset us, so easily knock us off course, so easily redirect our, our thinking and our lives. And run the race with patience. Verses 3 and 4. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Jesus endured so much that you and I might be redeemed. And with that redemption comes an outpouring of the love of God and the hope of eternal life. But until the day that we step into that hope, until the day that we step into that eternity, Jesus told us in John chapter 16, verse 33, in this world ye shall have tribulation. But don't be weary and faint in your mind, Christian. Your struggle against sin has not taken you where Jesus' payment for your sin took him. You have not resisted unto blood striving against sin. The call unto obedience is a call that is fraught with struggle. Struggle against temptation towards sin. Struggle against the weaknesses of the flesh that would compel you, again, even to be distracted by those things which are not sinful. As Paul would say in 1 Corinthians, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Our struggles with frailty, the frailty of the body, the weakness of the body, the, the, the tendency to uh, lose patience, to lose focus, to lose hope, to get discouraged, struggles with persecutions, something which most of us have not had to endure to a great degree, but which might very well be coming. So Jesus said in John 16, 33, In the world ye shall have tribulation. But many of you know what Jesus went on to say in that verse. He went on to say, But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And indeed, he has, Christian. And we know he has, because he told us he has. And I don't mean just in John 16. Jesus was hanging on a cross, and he said, It is finished. And he had overcome the world. Hebrews 12 goes on to acknowledge that the things God allows in his children are not easy things. Called in Hebrews 12, chastening. Not just speaking of reactive discipline for wrongs in our lives. Chastening is not just reactive discipline for wrongs in your life. Parents, we chasten our children in many other ways than just when they do wrong. Chastening is the idea of proactive discipline that grows us. My son may think that every time I send him out to chop wood, he's done something wrong, but I don't need him to have done something wrong for him to go out and chop wood because there's something about it that's going to help him whether he did wrong or not. There's going to be growing there. There's going to be usefulness there. But why is he doing it? Verse 10, Hebrews 12. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, 
speaking of our fathers in the flesh, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Why is it that our Lord chastens us? Well, because he hates me. Nope, your loving father does not chasten you because he hates you. Because he's displeased with me. Jesus said it is finished on that cross. It is finished, Christian. Why does he chasten you? Because he wants you to be a partaker in his holiness. There's not a, a moment, a single moment of your life in Christ where God will look down upon you and be displeased with you for when he looks at you, he sees his son, Jesus Christ, and he is pleased. But he does want you to grow. He does want you to be a partaker of his holiness. He does desire that you would be brought to that place of the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And because you are his child, he will not settle for anything less than that. Because to do so would be not to love you. He loves you too much to not direct you in the way that you need to go. To this end, we read in verses 11 through 13. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight the paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. So Christian... You're going through some things in this life. Trials, tribulations, weaknesses, frailties, discouragements. Lift up your head and turn your eyes up. You're struggling against the proclivities of your sin nature. The message of the cross is that Christ endured it all to redeem you and now it's your time to endure. Jesus Christ said on that cross, it is finished. And that was at the end of all of that endurance, of his tears in the garden, of his shame, of the mockery, of the scorn, of the pain, of the suffering. And at the end of all of that, it is finished. And the Bible says that as we go through our time of being called unto faithfulness in this world, in this world of sin and of this world of sorrow and of this world of difficulty and this world of temptation, as the weights and the sins that lay upon us seek to draw us away from the Lord and we try and endeavor to stay close to Him. We do so in the shadow. We, we sang this morning, uh, I take, O Lord, thy shadow is my abiding place. Or, O cross, I take, O cross, thy shadow is my, my abiding place. We abide in the shadow of the cross and we recognize that Christ endured those things and now it's our time to endure, but with this hope that Jesus already said, it is finished. Which means we are not enduring as a means by which to earn God's favor. We are not enduring as a means by which to gain our heavenly home. We have gained that in Christ already. We endure that we might be a partaker in his holiness. So don't give up. Keep the faith. Don't give in. Run with patience. It hasn't killed you yet. Be faithful. You're facing tremendous trials in your life. The message of the cross is that Christ endured all to show you his love. And now it is for you to rest in his good intentions toward you. So don't give up. Keep the faith. Run the race with patience. Live that crucified life in Christ, which we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. And now it's finished. And you are living in the shadow of that finished work. So we take one step at a time, one day at a time, as good and faithful servants of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what Jesus died in order to enable us to do, Christian. But all the more so, this is what Jesus' finished work on the cross compels us unto. 
if he has given all for my redemption, if he has finished the work, and then he has brought me into that redemption to then finish that work in me, let's let him. It's fitting, is it not? That if I look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame, that I then would rest in the shadow of that cross and give my life, which he has redeemed from sin and hell, back to him in the manner in which I live it. So you're tired. You're being asked to be faithful through something that you do not want to be faithful through. You're in a place of anxiety or a fear of vulnerability. You don't know what's next. You have to make decisions. Do you do what's right or do you not do what's right? And one of those is going to be very expedient and generally it's not doing what's right. You have weights that are, uh, that, that, that are, are holding you down. Not necessarily sins, but you know that those things, those things that, that, that you have the right to do are holding you down from what you ought to be otherwise doing. You have a sin, a besetting sin, and you're struggling with it. It all, every single one of these scenarios points back to it is finished. And then calls us then to turn our eyes upward and to say, Christ endured this, that he might finish this work. And I am in him. He is finishing that work in me. And these things are brought into my life that I might be a partaker of his holiness. I'm not going to resist that. I'm going to embrace that. I'm going to walk toward that going to live into that. May it be so with us this morning. Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.